Hey guys, good evening. Um, it's just about seven o'clock. Um, welcome to our uh, peeps at the Peeb. I'm not at the Peabody Heights Brewery tonight. It's oh. insanely hot air in Baltimore. It's still about 90. And uh, I was at a memorial service today up in uh, the Philadelphia area, so I just got back. Um, so I'm not sure if anybody went to the brewery tonight or not. Um, so welcome. Um, for those of you who went to Saber 51 last week, uh, hopefully it was an enjoyable time. Uh, I thought it was pretty good. Um, still recovering. Uh, <laughs> congratulations to Francis on winning the um, next uh, five years worth of uh, free conventions. So I'm glad I knew the person who won it. Yeah, that was um, a very lucrative uh, trip. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So con congrats, Francis. You, you deserve it. You've been a long, long time member and, uh, you know, stalwart, as they, as they say. Um, I will be sending some updated. We have some changes in some future uh, talks. Uh, some authors have, have uh, swapped in and out. So I'll be sending updated uh, information on that in the next week or so. And also, for those interested, uh, I can't make it, but uh, the Bob Davis chapter has a minor league game at Bowie, not this Saturday, but the following Saturday. So I'm going to send that out for those interested um, in attending. I believe it's Harrisburg at Bowie. Um, so for those interested, I'll send out the information and you can contact uh, their uh, chapter vice president if you'd like to attend. So. Um, Welcome everybody. Um, please mute if you're not participating at this time. Greatly appreciated. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Steve, who uh, just won the prestigious Chadwick Award uh, a few days ago um, at Saber 51. So he's going to talk to us about his book, uh, Baseball, um, The Turbulent Mid-Century Years, which I'm not sure when it came out, sometime within the last month or two, I believe. And uh, I'll let him introduce himself um and uh take it from there and we'll take questions either in the chat or uh orally once we're done okay thank you peter let me uh let me share my screen here Okay, can everybody see that? All right, good. Um, thank you for inviting me to speak to your group today. Um, I'm honored and flattered to be here. This is my first time giving this kind of presentation. So let's see uh, how it goes. I'm here to talk about my new book, uh, just out, just a couple of weeks ago. And I thought I would begin by reading one paragraph, one short paragraph to whet your appetite for the whole thing. This comes from uh, the prologue, kind of the backstory to the book. For a decade or so, the minor leagues prospered under the rules of 1903, at least somewhat. Leagues that had been operating outside the previous national agreement joined the fold and new leagues sprang up across the country. In 1902, 18 minor leagues had begun play, 15 within the National Association, and three outside its jurisdiction. Across the country and in Canada, leagues overlapped each other geographically, and club owners used colorful team nicknames to attract fans. The Jersey City Skeeters and Newark Sailors played in the Eastern League, the Peoria Distillers in the Western League, and the Binghamton Bingos and Utica Pentups in the New York State League. Uh, Steve, could I interrupt a second? We, sure. I don't see anything. All um, I see it, is your name and it has started sharing screen, but that's it. Same, same thing here. Hold on just a second. Thank you for the interruption. All right. I sent you a chat, but I guess uh, verbally is better. Let's see. How do we do this? It says my your screen sharing is paused. Let's try it all over again. Uh, 
There we go. There it is. All right. Yes, sir. Right now, great. Okay. Thank you for yeah. I'll there's a there's a bar at the top of my screen that is now green, and if it turns yellow, that means we've stopped again. All righty. Let me back up just a little bit. The Jersey City Speeders and Newark Sailors played in the Eastern League. The Peoria Distillers in the Western League, and the Binghamton Bingos and Utica Pentups in the New York State League. The Southern Association had the Memphis Egyptians, the Three I League, the Terre Haute Hottentots, the Western League, the Des Moines Midgets, and the Cotton States League, the Baton Rouge Cajuns. There were teams named for animals, bisons, broncos, bulls, colts, grizzlies, panthers, ponies, rabbits, and tigers, birds, blackbirds, canaries, mud hens, pelicans, and redbirds, colors, blues, browns, maroons, and reds, and occupations, brewers, clam diggers, cowboys, electricians, farmers, firemen, hustlers, marines, millers, smoke eaters, truckers, and whalers. There were colonels in Louisville, commodores in Decatur, millionaires in Colorado Springs, orators in Bridgeport, senators in Columbus and Lansing, and volunteers in Nashville. There were convicts and crooks, saints and apostles, lunatics, cotton pickers, hill climbers, gold bugs, and gas bags. And that was just the beginning. 21 leagues opened play in 1903, 34 in 1905, and 40 in 1908. By the end of the decade, 52 leagues started the season, a total that would not be surpassed until the late 1940s. Okay, that's just a taste. Um, to give you a little background, from 1940, 1986 to, 19, to 2008, I ran the research center at the Sporting News. Lots of SAVER members, including some maybe here today, use the research services we provided. In that capacity, I once gave a presentation on the future of baseball research. In other words, where the field was at that time and where it was going. During that presentation, I met Dorothy Seymour Mills, the widow of Dr. Harold Seymour. Together, they had published two foundational books on baseball history. Baseball, the early years that takes the sport from its beginnings to 1903, when the two major leagues settled the differences between them, and baseball, the golden age that moved the story forward to about 1930. Later, they added baseball, the people's game, to complete the trilogy. At that session, I asked Dorothy what she would think if someone picked up the ball where she and her late husband had laid it down and wrote a solid narrative and analytical history of the game since 1930. Without hesitation, she said, that's a good idea. And she heartily approved. But who would write such a book? I was well connected in the scholarly baseball history and research community. And I asked many people if they were interested in such a project. Everyone turned me down. And nearly everyone said the same thing. Steve, you should do this. My first reaction was that these folks are crazy. I was not a professor. I had a full-time job and a family to raise, but I did think about it. And then one day I sat down to lunch with the late Dan Ross, then the director of the University of Nebraska Press. And together we hacked out the beginning of what became a book proposal. Too many years later, this book, Baseball, the Turbulent Mid-Century Years, is the result. It is, in short, a book that explores the history of organized baseball during the middle of the 20th century.
Steve, I think you've frozen up, I think. I think we lost them. That, that's a real freeze. And Sophie joins back. Well, that explains it. Sorry yeah, I, that. Re I, I really apologize. All the lights went out. The only thing that was working was what my computer um, on batteries. But of course, we lost our internet connection when the power went out. I do apologize. Let's uh, let's try to pick up where we were. I hope this works. We can see your screen. Yeah, but I can't I can't advance from one slide to the next. All right. Well, let's see what happens. There we go. Okay. Let me pick up. I do apologize. So once I agreed with Dan Ross to submit a proposal for the book, the first question was how to define the book chronologically. In other words, where to begin and where to end. The where to end question was easier to answer. I decided quickly that taking the story from where the Seymours ended to the present would be way too much. So I settled on 1960 as an end point. The reason was quite simple. As you know, 1960, was the last season in which both major leagues had only eight teams. 1961, I argued, when the American League expanded from eight to 10, would be the start of a new era. But where to begin? As luck would have, I found the necrology section of the 1932 Spalding Guide called A Grim Harvest, an essay that noted the deaths of so many prominent baseball figures in 1931, Ben Johnson, his successor, Ernest Barnard, George Washington Bradley, who pitched the first no-hitter in the National League, Jack Cheesebro, Jimmy McAleer, Charles Murphy, and Bone Setter Reese, an idiosyncratic physical therapist. Plus, before the year was out, Gary Herman and Charlie Comiskey died, and Barney Dreyfus a few months later. I also recalled one of the first adult books I ever read, Barbara Tuckman's The Guns of August. It opens with the funeral of Edward VII in 1910, the last time all the crowned heads of Europe, most of them related to one another, gathered together 
before the Great War. And with that, I had my beginning, the grim harvest at the end of 1931. But really, not just where to begin, but how to begin, how to do the research. I was twice blessed. On the one hand, I presided over a great research library at the Sporting News with thousands of books and thousands of brown envelopes full of newspaper clippings. On the other hand, I gained access to the note cards that the Seymours themselves had compiled for books they did not have the time to write. The Seymour Collection is located at Cornell University where Dr. Seymour got his PhD. And I was able to go there and mine what I soon learned was a very rich collection. In addition, I had the benefit of the tremendous amount of research and publishing that Sabre members had done since Sabre was founded in 1971, the date of publication, incidentally, of the Seymour's second book. My book, therefore, would be a combination of narrative, that is the story of the game, and analysis, the why and the how. It would also be a combination of my own original research while incorporating the work of others, a project that academic historians call a synthesis. That's why the notes section and the bibliography are so long. Does this sound a little dull? Maybe. I kept in mind that I was trying to write for both a scholarly audience and writing for a popular audience at the same time. I recalled hearing David McCullough say, and I'm paraphrasing here, history is not hurt by writing it in a way that someone may actually want to read it. So I decided early on to avoid the heavy language of academia and also to avoid simply telling the story of one blasted season after another. I mean, when you think about it, baseball has no plot. There's a beginning, sure, but there's no climax, no ending. There's always next year. The solution I found was two pronged. First, I did not proceed strictly chronologically season by season. I identified themes to each of which I returned again and again as appropriate. Second, I decided to concentrate on people, to find one individual for each chapter, one person whose career encapsulated certain events about which I wanted to write in that chapter. Understand that I did not write a series of biographical sketches, instead, the career of one individual winds in and out of each chapter during which I discuss the game's history, its politics, its economics, and its relationship with the rest of American history. I wound up writing a prologue and 14 chapters. In a sense, these can be divided into three sections, the Great Depression, World War II, and the post-war years. The prologue and first six chapters, which include some considerable backstory, focus on the Great Depression. And the persons profiled therein are Ernest Bernard, the second president of the American League, Connie Mack, Branch Rickey, Kennesaw Landis, Ed Barrow, and Larry McPhail. Here we look at such things as declining attendance, downward pressure on salaries, reluctance to lower ticket prices, contraction of the miners, the advent of radio broadcasting, battles over farm systems and the minor league draft, and various innovations like the All-Star Game, the creation of the Hall of Fame, and the establishment of numerous postseason awards. The middle section covers World War II. It homes in on Hank Greenberg, Don Barnes, the owner of the Browns, and Yogi Berra. Here we see the reaction of baseball to the start of the war in Europe. FDR's green light letter organized baseball's patriotic effort to contribute to the war effort while simultaneously trying to keep players on the field and spectators in the stands. The impact of the military draft, the pronounced decline in the quality of play, restrictions on spring training and travel, the change in the composition of the baseball itself, and the annual debate over whether the federal government would shut the game down entirely. The third part studies the post-war years, 
and its main characters are Tom Yawkey, Bill Veck, Red Barber, Ford Frick, Henry Aaron, and Bill Shea. Here we look at returning veterans, labor relations, race, demographic change, television, and the threat of government intervention leading into expansion. Plus, safer travel by air, old decrepit ballparks, problems signing young players more interested in attending college than playing in the minors, and the persistence of the peacetime selective service draft. It is a big book, admittedly, but I hope it is readable, and I hope it holds your attention. Let me conclude by reading just one more paragraph, after which we can take some questions. This is the beginning of chapter 10 about Bill Veck. The idea, in the words of the man charged with executing it, was to sell beautiful Wrigley Field. That is to make the park itself so great an attraction that it would be thought of as a place to take the whole family for a delightful day. Phil Wrigley, principal owner of the Chicago Cubs, since his father's death in January 1932, was convinced that a team's daily performance and daily attendance went hand in hand. Young Bill Veck Jr. was cut from a vastly different cloth from his boss, but he thought this conclusion was inescapable. Like Wrigley, he believed that a team that isn't winning a pennant has to sell something in addition to its won and lost record to fill in those low spots on the attendance chart. As a boy, Veck, whose father had run the Cubs for Wrigley's father starting in 1919, was pretty much free to roam all over what was then called Cubs Park. I am, he later claimed, the only human being ever raised in a ballpark. After his father's death from leukemia in October 1933, Beck returned to Kenyon College to finish football season, left school to move in with his mother and father, and sought employment with the Cubs. Getting a job, first as an office boy, and later as Wrigley's assistant seemed quite natural. As an owner, Wrigley started slowly in Vic's memory. He made sure the ballpark was painted. He widened the box seats. He shooed away sidewalk vendors and newspaper boys. He put ushers outside to direct fans to the entrances and he trained ticket sellers to be polite. All these changes helped, but beautiful Wrigley Field did not come to pass until Wrigley put Vec in charge of the project after the 1936 season. End of paragraph. Okay, if you're interested, you can order the book directly from the press or buy it from any bookstore or bookseller. If you want a signed copy, contact me by email. And there's my email address at the bottom of the screen, sgitch at gmail.com. All righty, let me stop sharing the screen here. There we go. All right, I'm back. Questions, comments? Karen. Great presentation, Steve. Thank you, Lewis. Thank right. you. We, I'm not sure how to do this, but uh, I saw Karen's hand up. Karen, you're muted. Not now. Okay, good. The, you were talking about the minor leagues. Yes. And everybody was using uh, different animals. You know, well, I have on the Cedar Rapids Rabbits t shirt. There you go. Excellent. That was established in 1896. 96, yes. Right. So I just tons thought of, I'd let you know that tons of, I appreciate that. Tons of nicknames. Anything to try to sell a ticket. Yeah. And, and Steve, don't forget the prune pickers. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, this is a very long book. Um, most, uh, most of the books you see on the bookseller's table are somewhere between 80,000 and 100,000 words. Mine clocks in at 220,000 words. Oh. <laughs> it's, it's 450 pages of text. Um, I hope those who buy it will, will say, I got my money's worth. Someone else, questions, comments? Guys, just ask away or put it in the chat. 
Oh yeah, the chat. Let's look there. Steve, I have a question. Sure. And as you went through your research, and you, know, you obviously had some preconceived notions of what your themes were going to be, um, did anything really surprise you as, as you dug in that kind of changed the direction of one or more of your chapters? Well, I, you know, I don't know that I had preconceived notions. I think the book evolved as I as I moved through it. Um, and and as a writer, I try not to make judgments. Um, I present narrative and analysis and leave the judgment to, uh, to others. Um, a friend of mine is reading the book. And after four chapters, he told me today, boy, I've really grown to hate the reserve clause. Okay, fine. Um, that's, not something, that's not something I say directly. I just lay out the facts and let people come to their own conclusion. But in terms of change, um, I, I think one, one thing that I really hadn't thought about before I wrote the chapter is, I know this will surprise you, how little power Kenneth Saul Landis really had. I heard someone say the other day, he ruled the baseball with an iron fist. Um, I'm inclined to disagree. And in fact, if you, if you, if you chalk up the Black Sox um, expulsions as his first great victory, I'm not sure that he had a second great victory. I think he was at the mercy of league presidents and owners for the rest of his career. He fought a losing battle against the creation of farm system. There's no question about that. Um, and uh, I, you know, I'll leave it to others, maybe David Petrucia, his biographer, to tell me why we should consider Landis to be a great commissioner. So well, there's that is that. surprising, thank you. Yeah, that is interesting. Uh, it certainly goes against the common narrative. Yeah, uh, yeah I suppose it does. Um, and uh, you know, others are free to uh, disagree. I, I suppose the other thing that, uh, you know, I talked about this at the convention a little bit, is in the post-war years, when, uh, when baseball was faced with labor troubles, with the question of race, with the American population moving from the north and the east to the south and the west, with people beginning to uh, move to suburbia and watch television, um, baseball did not know what to do. The leadership of the game was, I think, extremely lacking. Um, Ford Frick became commissioner in 1951. He lasted until 1965. Um, if you look at Frick's quotes on baseball and television, over 10 years, he's on all sides and therefore no sides of the question. What should baseball do? Well, I don't know. Um, the two league presidents, Will Harridge in the American League and then John, uh, Joe Cronin and Warren Giles in the National League, equally without a clue. I think they loved looking backwards and were afraid of change and change was staring them in the face and they couldn't avoid it and baseball stumbled, it stuttered throughout the 1950s. Even when we get to expansion, when the American League adds two teams in 61 and the National League adds two teams in 62, the two leagues did not work in concert. They were fighting each other. And neither of them knew what the other was gonna do until the next press conference. So there's that. John. Steve, thanks. Steve. Yeah, John. Steve, you kind of alluded to the fact that Landis really wasn't what he's packed up to be. Uh, and you touched on Frick. Who really wielded any of the powers that, was it certain owners that were guiding the direction of the game or was there no one guiding the direction of the game? Well, that John, that's, that's, that's a good question. Um, I think you might say yes to, to both of those. Um, there were certain owners. Um, there was a certain deference paid to the old owners, to people like Clark Griffith, who had been in the game for half a century, to Connie Mack before he became too old really to make intelligent uh, decisions. Um, Tom Yawkey had a lot of money and uh, surprise, money speaks. And of course, as we get into the 1950s, the owner who comes to the forefront in the National League is, uh, is Walter O'Malley. Um, baseball, I think, after the war um, had this attitude. The war is over. We've won. 
let's go back to the way things were. But there never was a time when the way things were was satisfactory. Baseball didn't, you know, despite romantic memories of Babe Ruth, there was never a decade, if that's how we try to divide history, there was never a decade of, of stability and, and, and steady progress. So the problems that the game faced after 1945 were unique and baseball just hoped, um, spoken or unspoken, to stumble through. This is the national pastime. People will keep coming to the ballpark. And after this season ends, we'll have next season. Now, to a certain extent, that's, that lack of strategy worked. Really, um, baseball succeeds despite itself, in my opinion. But again, that's just me. Uh, Steve, in the decades since uh, the decades that you cover in your book, would you say that there has been a decade where baseball has really gained? Well, gained, Francis, it, you know, I mean, it, it was very clear, I think, by the mid-1960s that in terms of a spectator sport on television, professional football had moved to the, had moved to the forefront. Um, for any number of reasons, including the, uh, the outstanding leadership of Pete Rozelle. Um, at the end of the, you know, the Sporting News used to do a, a, a big story at the end of each year, listing the 100 most powerful people in sports. And at the end of the century, 1999 into 2000, we did a list of the 100 most important, most powerful people in sports for the entire century. And Pete Rozelle, was number one. We had a uh, we had a reception in New York where the four existing commissioners were there, and they all idolized Pete Rozelle. Um, in terms of leadership, I know there are a lot of people who are not going to like this, but I think Bud Selig was a really strong commissioner. You know, he's not working for us. He's not working for the fans. He's working for the owners, and almost every vote the owners took under his stewardship was unanimous that says something yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, steve Mark. yes sir uh, steve i'd like to thank you for writing the book because uh this is a tremendously large long task uh, uh anyone who's written uh, a book knows it takes a long time and it's a lonely craft for the most part although the more we interact with fellow Sabre members or other fans we know, the more interesting or fun it can become. But uh, that's uh, so many hours that you've spent putting it together, pulling it together. But I have one question. Did you cover much about uh, the fans and how things were different during that period to some extent, say, than now? I mean, back then, we were still looking at the box scores every day in the paper with ease. Now I find it a lot harder to toggle back and forth on the internet and find what I want to find or, or in the uh, 50s or 60s, 40s, maybe uh, uh, the, the role of baseball cards for, uh, for youngsters or that kind of thing. Did you talk much about the fans in your book? Well, you know, uh, Mark, I, I think in the period that I write about, from about 1930 to 1960, the fan experience um, doesn't change all that much. We didn't have to deal with the internet in 1960. We were still looking at box scores in the daily newspaper and in the sporting news. Um, I think what happens after the war, and certainly right. this happened to my family, is uh, is family members moved out of apartments in the city where they could use public transportation to get to many ballparks, to the suburbs, to a single family home on a piece of green space, well manicured with grass or crabgrass, and to get to the ballpark required a trip by automobile. Um, right. My dad grew up in Queens. He was a Dodgers fan that is Queens, the borough of New York City, for those of you not familiar. Um, he could get to Ebbets Field, he was a Dodgers fan, by taking a couple of buses and maybe a, a subway. Um, when we grew up, when I grew up in Nassau County, going to Ebbets Field by car was like a day-long trip. We had to pack lunch to get there. So I only went, you know, once a season. And in addition, of course, in the 1930s and 40s, if you can't go to the ballpark, you can listen to the game on the radio. 
right. owners were owners were afraid that if we broadcast games on the radio, people wouldn't come to the ballpark. Sure. But the exact opposite was true. People heard the games on the radio and they said, this is so exciting. I want to be there. A similar phenomenon removed from baseball was when radio stations began to play records. And record producers said, if you play the music for free on the radio, nobody's going to buy the record. The exact opposite was true. Young people said, I want to own this record. I want to play it 10 times an hour every day, right. every day. Now, yeah. television is a different animal. You can watch the games on television and attendance declined as a result. But what baseball didn't understand is that people weren't staying home from the ballpark to watch baseball on television. They were staying home to watch television. Right. Magic, Milton Berle, Bishop Sheen, Arthur Godfrey, the Goldbergs. Um, my students used to ask me, Dr. G, when did people buy televisions? And my answer was, as soon as they could. <laughs> Magic. True. Right. You know, we think of the, some people think of the 1950s as a golden age for baseball. It was not. Except for the attendance of the teams that moved, the Braves to Milwaukee, the Dodgers, the Giants, attendance goes down steadily throughout the 1950s. And the ballparks, which we now romanticize, were filthy. Steve, yeah. another question. You triggered a little question now. You covered 1957 in your book. Yes. You grew up in Queens. Yes. Well, Matt, your father was a Georgia fan. Yes. O'Malley wouldn't move the team to Queens. Instead, he moves it. He blames Moses. Instead, he moves it to Los Angeles. That never really made sense to me. <laughs> what well, was your reaction? You, you know, the, uh, the, the chapter on expansion begins, well, early on, begins with a quotation from a president of the United States who said, in my retirement, I would like to visit California. You know who that president was? Abraham Lincoln. The lure of California, warm weather, the sun shining, the ocean is just incredible. And the people in LA, they made O'Malley a, a, a pretty good deal. It wasn't perfect. And it required a, you know, a, some political machinations and a vote, um, but, uh, but he was at loggerheads with Moses. I mean, you can blame O'Malley or you can blame Moses. I'm not gonna get into that yeah. game right right now um but uh, the fact is is they could not come to an agreement and uh, and o o'malley had a pretty good deal on the table and let's not forget Cara stoneham wanted to move too we sometimes think of stoneham as a minor player as a puppet that o'malley manipulated i don't think that's true at all if you read steve tredder's book on Cara stoneham yeah. the book that won the seymour medal last year um, you'll find that Stoneham was a mover and a shaker too. It wasn't just it wasn't just O'Malley, and uh, you know the O'Malley said, "Give me the land, I'll build the ballpark." What a proposition, and it worked. Yeah, thank you. Someone else, uh, Steve. Um, a little clarification here. Uh, when the teams expanded. Um, in 61 and 62, the teams played 162 games. Is that correct? That is correct. All right. Around the turn of the um, century, uh, 20th century, teams played uh, roughly 140 games. The, you know, the, the schedule varied sometimes from year to year, um, uh, was cut to 140 games in, uh, let's see, 1918 and 1919. And then 154 games became standard in 1920 and remained the standard until, uh, until expansion in 1961. Right. Yes. Okay. You divide seven into 100, you get 22 games against each team. So every team is making three trips to every other ballpark. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Sure. And I'm enjoying your talk. Glad you could uh, re reconnect. I'm so am I. Speaking to a blank screen was no fun. Yeah. Another question. Someone comment. 
criticism. Steve, to follow up on that last point, how much do you think the rivalries have suffered with the teams now playing each other less and less with, you know, there's a lot of good things I like about the balance schedule, but you're not playing your rivals as much. And, you know, like it or not, you were playing back in the, up through the fifties, you were playing the same team 22 times each year. And then they tended to get on each other's nerves, uh, seeing each other that much. Uh, you know, how much do you think the game has suffered from that? Well, I think the, I think, you know, obviously we're, we're going beyond the last page of my book and that's okay. Um, but that means that everybody has an opinion that is at least as good as mine on this, uh, on this question. You know, I, I grew up a Dodgers fan and then we morphed into Mets fans and our number one rival is not even in the national league. It's a good day for Mets fans when the Mets win and the Yankees lose. You know, now I'm living in uh, suburban St. Louis and have since 1986. I'm not a Cardinals fan. I'm still a Mets fan. The Cardinals' great rival is the Cubs. And I don't think it matters how many times the Cardinals play the Cubs. Cardinal fans will hate the Cubs, and Cubs fans will hate the Cardinals re regardless. Um, you know, last year um, was, the, was the last year that division rivals were going to play each other 19 times. This year it's less because they're playing all the other teams in the other league more. So we gave here in St. Louis, we gave up games against the Pirates, we gave up games against the Reds, we gave up games against the Cubs, but guess who came to town for three days in March or April? Shohei Otani. Thank you very much. So it cuts both ways. Um, you know, the, the Mets and Yankees are still at IG's throat, the Dodgers and Giants still hate each other. Um, I think the rivalries have in a certain sense uh, survived. Um, and who knows? Thank you for the answer. That was very interesting. Sure. Someone else. <clears throat> Hi, Steve. Uh, I, Hi, really, I, I look forward to reading your book. Um, Thank you. Right in the middle of the area era you cover is Jackie Robinson. Uh, yes. How much do you get into that cataclysmic, turbulent uh, event? and the effect on both the Negro Leagues and the influx of talent in the major leagues? Boy, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, when, when you get to important events like the desegregation of the major leagues, you have to think as an author, you have to think really carefully about your audience. Who are you writing for? Who do you expect to read this book? How much do you think they know already? How much do you have to tell them? Obviously, a lot has been written about Branch Rickey and Jackie Robinson. Tremendous book by Jules Tigel on the integration of baseball. Tremendous biography of Branch Rickey by Lee Lowenfish. So I think the, the, the strategy I adopted is, is to, tell, you know, to tell the story in a certain sense Make sure the major points are clear, but not go blow by blow, not try to rewrite other books. And in the course of writing that chapter, to quote those authors, put their names in the text and in the footnotes so that anybody who says, you know, he's told me something about Jackie Robinson, but I really need to learn more, can go to the notes, look at my sources and dig deeper. It's um. It, it's, a really, it's a really good question because as, as an author, it's something I had to think about a lot, a lot. How much to tell folks? What do people already know? You know, we're Sabre members and we know a lot about baseball. Um, but I hope that this book finds an audience beyond the Sabre membership with, for people, you know, my, my friend, I just referred to him, um, uh, He's finished with chapter four and I met him for lunch today. And he said, I'm learning something new in every paragraph. Mm -hmm. Boy, does that put a smile on your face? You know, if he had said, boy, you're, you're boring me stiff. Tell me something new. Ooh, then I would have failed. So we'll see. We'll see when people get to that chapter, what they think. Thank you. Sure. Someone else. Steve. Uh, in, in your discussion about baseball never seems to solve a problem until it's dropped on their 
lab, have they ever anticipated a problem and addressed it before it became a problem? Well, I'd have to I'd have to think about that. Um, you know, the sh the short answer would be no, um, but that that really can't be. I mean, there have to be smart people working behind the scenes in Major League Baseball who are anticipating and planning for the future. But on the other hand, you know, look at the, the, the move of the A's or the proposed move of the A's to Las Vegas. Is that being handled smoothly? Do we know exactly what's going to happen? Is Major League Baseball going to survive in a city that where it's hotter most of the time than it is in, in most places now in a ballpark that seats only 30,000 people? I don't know. And, and you know, the other, the other problem that I think baseball is just beginning to address is something we've all complained about, and that is blackouts on MLB TV. You know, if you live in Las Vegas right now, you're considered to be in the territory of the Colorado Rockies, the Arizona Diamondbacks, San Diego, the Angels, the Dodgers, the Giants, the A's, and the Mariners. Yikes. How can you create a fan base when people can't watch the games of a third of the teams in Major League Baseball? Now, baseball says they're working on that. Commissioner Manfred said, you know, we're going to solve this problem. Well, where have they been? This is not new. So I'm not going to give them high marks for thinking ahead. I really am not. Yeah, Karen. Every time I've gone to, I've watched some of the baseball games, I get the poke, I get poker. <laughs> and I'm thinking, wait a minute. And I'm watching and watching and there's no baseball. It's all poker. Yeah. Yeah. I know you folks in the, in the Baltimore, Washington area have had your own TV problems too with the Orioles and the, and the Nationals. I don't know the details you do. Um, but, uh, you know, we hope it's resolved satisfactorily. But, you know, the sport has got to allow its fans to see their product. You're right. See, when else? I live in Southern Pennsylvania, I can't watch the Nationals, the Orioles, the Phillies, or the Pirates. Yeah, yeah, right. It's, it's crazy, you know. And, you know, when the, when, the, when, the, when the Mets are playing the Cardinals, I'd love to watch that game on the Mets television network can't do it have to watch the pirates uh, excuse me the cardinals local telecast now that's a small point but it's there someone else on that point um for my information maybe other people know but is one area of the country is not affected by blackouts is it just the wide expanses of the prairies and things? I, you know, Francis, I don't know how big those circles are. You know, if you live in North Dakota, are you blocked out from the twins? Maybe. I don't, I, I, I don't know. It, it would be a really interesting question to draw a map of those places that are not blocked out from any telecast. But mm -hmm. given that, you know, the geographic expanse of the game, and the notion that some of these teams like the Rockies have really regional following, um, I'm not sure if there's any place. Maybe Hawaii is not considered Dodgers territory. Who knows? <laughs> or Alaska is probably Mariners territory. <laughs> yeah. Steve, I don't think Fargo could get the twins. No, there you go. Yeah. You know, uh, the, the notion that you're going to jump in your car in Fargo at four o'clock in the afternoon to go see a Twins game. That's a stretch, guys. Not gonna happen. <laughs> Not gonna happen. No. I've been to Fargo. <laughs> Good for you. Okay, anyone else? Guys, anyone else? We had a good turnout tonight. This is uh, I'm very, very impressed with you guys. Thank you. I know we're a week late because of uh, Sabre 51 last week. Um, and, Someone uh, is, oh, yeah. Somebody just sent a link to the um, blackout maps. Yes. That was, 
that was me. Thank there you. you go. Thank you very. Thank you very much. We'll take a. We'll take a look at that. Um, let, well, let me conclude just by re repeating. Um, if you're interested in buying the book, you can get it at any bookstore. You can order it directly from the University of Nebraska Press. Don't worry about the URL. Just go to the press's website and search on my last name. And uh, and if you want a signed copy, um, send me an email. Uh, I've got books here. We'll come to an arrangement. I'll sign it and uh, and send it to you uh, relatively relatively quickly. Thank you all for attending. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your comments and questions. Some of you at least were paying attention. That's just great. There's no quiz. Thank you so much. All right, guys. Well, have a good night. So, uh, um, one last question. Where yes, did sir. the term black, uh, blackout come from? And has ever anybody written a book about that? Good question. I don't know. Anybody know blackout? I mean, obviously, if you you know if you go back to World War II, blackout was used for turning off all the lights so that enemy planes couldn't see where cities and buildings were. Um, the National Football League, when it started televising its games, televised just road games, not not home games. And and the term blackout was used there. Other than that, anybody else have a clue? Yeah. Uh, well, that's our homework, I guess, for next time. Thanks, Tom, for giving us some homework. <laughs> You're welcome. There's right. also a possibility of the sister uh, term brownout. Yeah, we'll which is, I think, I think that's what I experienced about 35 minutes ago. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we ap appreciate you, Steve. I assume you're back home in the uh, St. Louis area. Yes, and um, I, I do hope you folks notice I'm wearing a Bluefields Orioles cap. Yeah. I have one of those. Yeah. Um, interesting story. I went once to see Bluefield. They uh, they ceased being an Orioles affiliate around 2010, I want to say, um, in the Appy League. I went. I drove once all the way to uh, to see a game. And it's way down in the corner of like Virginia, West Virginia, and where Tennessee all come together. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they changed the time of the game. Oh dear! And uh, so I got to see the field and 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 meet some people, but they moved it. But I had to be back, you know, by a certain time. I never got to actually see them play, but it was a a lovely uh, lovely little town <laughs> once you once you got there. But um, I'm not sure if they have baseball there now at all since the, you know, the Appalachian League and some of those other things that uh, when they re, you know, redid the minors in, in 2021, I'm not sure if they survived. Right. Bluefield lost it. My, my wife's family is from Bluefield. And in fact, we're going there um, next weekend. It's a town like a lot of towns that's down on its luck. The, uh, the field is beautiful. There are mountains in the background. The seats come from Memorial Stadium in Baltimore. They're, they're bright orange wow. and, uh, and they're put in place. And I looked at them and the numbering system was absurd. One, seven, three, eight, four, four, two, nine. I said, what's going on here? And the guy who gave us the tour said, it's general admission. You can sit anywhere you want. <laughs> the numbers don't matter. I said, this is baseball, all numbers matter. That's a college league. They have a college league team now, right? Okay. There you go. Great. Appalachian League. Uh, that's true. Safe trip to Bluefield. Uh, it was a very pretty little park. Yes, um, it is. And uh, at, I believe at one point they were the longest tenured minor league uh, for like 50 some seasons with the yeah. Orioles. Yeah, we go. That Let's see. So I think now the longest tenured. Uh, minor league, major league affiliation is uh, Philadelphia with uh, Reading. Yeah, there we go. 50 yep. years. Yeah. All right. Okay. So, well, appreciate it, guys. A... Um, I will be. Hello. I'm As still here. Point of inquiry. Uh, is it true that in Bluefield, uh, you can hit a home run in the Virginia, uh, like I always do. I, it is pretty much on the state line. I'm not sure no. if the ball could actually 
go over the wall and be in a different state, but it's right on the border. I know that much. Yeah. The, uh, Bluefield has a couple of distinctions. In baseball, if you know the name Tony Stone, a yeah. woman who played in the Negro Leagues, she was born in Bluefield. And the non-baseball fact about Bluefield is that they advertise themselves as the world's only naturally air-conditioned city. If the temperature rises above 90 degrees in Bluefield, the next day, the Chamber of Commerce serves free lemonade for anybody who wants. Mm -hmm. Maybe a so place there. to retire to. Yeah. Well, on that note, uh, much appreciated, Steve. Congrats Thank on your award. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for and, your attention. Uh, you guys will be in touch. Be on the lookout for emails. For those of you on the East Coast, I know it's, a lot of us are baking here, so try to stay as cool as possible. Um, the Orioles are back home this weekend, starting Friday. We have three against, make sure I get this right, the Marlins. Um, and actually, Steve's Mets will be here the first weekend of August. All right. So, Grudge match. Yeah. Yeah. So, I sure yeah. hope the Orioles make the playoffs. I think that's a great story. Well, and for the Mets series, we're looking forward to it. One, they're honoring uh, 40th anniversary of the 83 World Series team that weekend. Um, but also, I want to see how Buck will be received coming back to Cannon Yard. Uh huh. Yes. So. Yeah. All right. All righty, guys. Uh, okay. Have a great evening, and uh, we'll see you uh, next time around. And Steve, thank you. You remember when we used to have a major league team, also <laughs> here in St. Louis? Yes, right. <laughs> Maybe one day in the future, baseball will return to St. Louis. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, okay. everybody. Have thank a good you. Evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.